My father had, uh, was the head of a settlement house in the Bronx. He had been recruited to run the settlement house, which was a Jewish settlement house. And there were fewer Jews in the vicinity in the South Bronx, East, East 156th Street. So uh, he was recruited by a professor from Penn who was sent to recruit him because he was one of the first three, there were three of them who became, who were professional social workers in Puerto Rico. My family had achieved kind of middle class status in Puerto Rico and uh, they were both, both my parents were college graduates. Um, I, f I have my mother's uh, University of Puerto Rico degree in my New York chambers. 1930, she was very unusual. And so she grudgingly accompanied my father to uh, what he viewed as a very important mission to help our people in the Bronx and in New York. And so he became prominent in civic affairs. He also would write for La Prensa and El Diario. He'd write articles uh, and commentaries. The, the, Puerto, the Puerto Ricans, the Hispanics, were so out of it politically and in, in the consciousness of the civic community of New York that this, these committees were never, as far as I know, headed by a Puerto Rican or a, or a Hispanic person. It was, a, it was literally a committee to deal with advice on the Puerto Rican problem. And I remember distinctly the name of the uh, Mayor Wagner appointed his Yale College roommate, Edward G. Miller, who's a fine man. My father thought very highly of him. Edward G. Miller's claim to the chairmanship of this committee, well, he was a partner, I think, at, at Sullivan and Cromwell and then at Paul Weiss. <clears throat> Ed Miller had been born in Juncos, Puerto Rico. By coincidence, his father was an engineer in a sugar mill in Puerto Rico in the 30s, I guess, or 20s. And he was a roommate of Robert Wagner at Yale College. And that was enough. I mean, he was sympathetic, of course. Uh, and my father was vice chairman. But, but, it, but it tells you something that the Puerto Ricans had not, uh, the Hispanics had not risen in visibility uh, enough to even be chair chair of the committees on the Puerto Rican affairs. So that's an important and now largely forgotten episode in the history of New York City. It was Governor Pineda who appointed my father to go from the settlement house to, the, um, uh, to a new office that was established, the government of Puerto Rico's office in New York, because they needed to have somebody speak for the Puerto Rican government, it was thought. And my father became the first head of that office. So he was in the middle of, of the back and forth, and he would write articles in English and Spanish, explaining, there's a, there's a book that I have in my office, which I've shown to my law clerks. It's entitled, La Familia González. And, and the title suggests that they're hit, they arrived in New York just like the Pilgrim Fathers. So there's, a, there's an attempt to sort of say, no, we're just, very, we're just like all the other people who came here. Uh, calm down, don't get excited. So that was part of my father's job. And in 1950, when the Nationalists uh, uh, had a, there was an uprising of sorts in Puerto Rico, there was an attempt on the life of President Truman by Puerto Rican nationalists. They threw bombs into my father's office at the same time in New York. Uh, happily, they did not explode. Uh, they were duds. So it was, a, it was a tough time among Puerto Ricans and between Puerto Ricans and the general community. But even though it's New York and you would think there'd be great national visibility, there was nothing in terms of uh, 
of national consciousness. But 1960 is a watershed <clears throat> in Texas and in California for the Mexican American. And al along with many other uh, leaders of the Puerto Rican community, my father became part of the Kennedy, of the Viva Kennedy Clubs. Now, the only significance of this, in my view, is that in 1960, the, the Hispanics are barely visible nationally. It's hard to believe, but I have in my office an invitation to my parents to the inauguration of JFK in 1960. And it's from Angier Biddle Duke. Let me repeat that name. Angier Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E, as in the banking family in, in Philadelphia. Duke, as in the tobacco family in uh, North Carolina. My father used to refer to him as Bidel, Bidel Duke. Bidel Duke. Now, Bidel Duke, this invitation to my parents is to attend the inauguration and to meet other representatives, quote, representatives of the Latin American community of the United States. Because Andrew Biddle Duke was JFK's campaign manager for the Hispanics. There was a campaign for the first time. There was a national campaign which included some concern about the, this community which was barely visible, and it was headed by Angier Biddle Duke, who was a fine guy by all accounts, and who was married to a Salvadoran woman whom my parents would celebrate because they could speak to her in Spanish and all of this. But Biddle Duke, as a result of his work in the, with the so-called uh, uh, Hispanics, Biddle Duke was named by JFK to be chief of protocol of the State Department of the United States. A very important position, very visible. But he was there, in effect, because he had headed the Viva Kennedy Clubs. And, organ and he had organized for the first time the Hispanic community of the United States. But, but they still were disparate, isolated group, groups, isolated from each other. There was no communication to speak of, except perhaps through uh, AP stories or UPI that might be carried in local Spanish language newspapers. Culturally, you have to remember the Hispanic community, again, we're talking about Puerto Ricans, unavoidably, until the 1970s, when you said Hispanic, in New York, you're talking, talking about Puerto Ricans. So, among the middle class educated uh, Hispanics and the Puerto Ricans were people who had been edu educated in Puerto Rico, but who were very, uh, very much, I, what can I say, isolated. They were, not, they were not important in the general culture or civic life of the city, that's for sure. But they had organizations, no question about it. And the Puerto Ricans organized invariably, and this included working class and poor people, they would organize clubs based on their hometown. So you would have the Ponce Association, you would have the Hayuya Association. And these were, and that was really quite, if you think, if one thinks about it, very common in, in other migrations to New York and to the States. Among Jews, for example, there were all kinds of associations uh, at the turn of the 19th century based on the community from which these immigrants had come. And the importance of these groups is, is that before there was a social safety net, or a very modest one, these groups, these hometown groups, could help, were, were organized for self-help. They would help their, uh, their neighbors and friends, uh, family members from the same town, from Umacao, from Fajardo. Uh, 
con San Sebastián del Pepino. Uh, so that, so that, that's, that's how they were organized. And they would, they would be photographed in El Diario as having a meeting somewhere in some restaurant. And you'd see 20, 25 people smiling uh, who were meeting to discuss things. So they, they, these were self-help organizations by and large. The Puerto Rican Day Parade, uh, like all of these parades in New York, based on ethnic affinity. These are ways of announcing to the general population. It, they, they serve a lot of different purposes. One purpose is, we're here. Don't look now. If you look down Fifth Avenue, we're here. So it's, a, it's an announcement of, um, of, the, of the group's existence, whether it's the Pulaski Day Parade, or the Steuben Day Parade, the Columbus Day Parade. So that's a, that's a, those are acts of affirmation, civic affirmation. And uh, I attended many such parades with my father just uh, to watch them. I was always struck by the fact that the Puerto Rican Day Parade, the first marchers were the policemen, the Puerto Rican policemen, including Puerto Rican mounted police. So you'd have these two or four or six mounted policemen would lead the parade to the great cheers of the, of the crowd of Puerto Ricans on Fifth Avenue. And I always used to tell my friends, my non-Puerto Rican friends who came with me, that the next time somebody tries to explain to you what the Puerto Rican view of policing is, uh, remind them of who led the Puerto Rican Day Parade. This is not a community which is hostile, uh, by definition or otherwise, to, 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 the, to the police. All right, so let me, uh, let me turn to the two of you. I would love for both of you Judge Irizarry and Judge Reyes, to say a little bit about your, how your families came to the uh, States. Because one of the real benefits of this panel is that we have a uh, nice distribution across generations of Puerto Rico or Hispanic um, life in New York. So, I would like, let's begin with, uh, with you, Judge Irizarry. Thank you, Judge. Um, I've, I've been fascinated by your, dis your discussion about what it was like coming to New York in, in the late 1940s. My father had come as a teenager in 1946. I think he was 19 years old and um, actually a little younger than that. And he just remembers the big blizzards and the snow and not having enough clothes to wear and didn't like it at all and went back to Puerto Rico. <laughs> I bet. And uh, wound up getting drafted for the Korean War, but the GI Bill allowed him to get a high school education in Puerto Rico. And he married my mother and... Uh, in 1955, after I was born, they came to New York with me. So um, we settled in the South Bronx as well, in uh, what was called Banana Kelly. And, uh, and we had a lot of people from our hometown. And, and, and what you said um, really struck home because most of the people from my hometown were sugarcane workers. Um, uh, they were agrarian, by and large. We came from the mountain towns. We were jibaritos from the mountains. And uh, by and large, most of us lived in the tenements and were pretty poor. Uh, a few who were slightly better off lived in housing projects, which actually, actually weren't so bad at the time. And um, like most, of, most immigrant groups, there are the one or two that come before. 
who set the stage for everybody else and who help everybody else get a job, get the kids in school and so on. And for us, that was my mother's oldest sister, Maria. Um, everybody knew her. I always said that had she been given the opportunity to get an education, she might have been governor of Puerto Rico because she was very in tune to politics and very smart and read every newspaper she could get her hand on in Spanish. She only had a first grade education because being a woman, that was all she needed to know was how to sign her name basically and read a little bit. Um, my mother was unusual because she got to finish high school because her older brother paid her way to finish high school. Um, and most women did not get to go all the way to high school, much less college, like, like your mother. I attended public schools in the neighborhood. Some of them were really pretty bad. There were high crime rates in the schools that I went to. But thank goodness for gifted programs. And, um, and so uh, I and my siblings were able to do fairly well in school. We did go up in the world by moving to the housing projects. We were the first families to live in the housing projects in what was Morrisania Heights in the Bronx, and actually not far from Melrose House. We were on 167th Street and Webster Avenue, which was maybe about 11 blocks or so uh, from where Melrose House uh, was. Most of us, most of my mother's side of the family tended to stay in the Bronx. My father's side went to Brooklyn. Um, and um, some lived in the Marcy houses. Uh, some lived in Bushwick a lot. A lot of them lived in Bushwick and in Greenpoint and in Williamsburg, Los Sure of Williamsburg. And, um, and my mother's family also moved to the Lower East Side. And it was a, a, a funny thing how children view things because when we would go visit my family in the Lower East Side, those tenements were much older than the ones that we lived in. And some of the families were larger than ours. There were six kids, eight kids living in a two bedroom house. And I would come home and I would tell my mother, gee, our family, the, our relatives are so poor. And she would laugh and she said, what makes you think that we're rich? And I said, well, they're poorer than we are because of the way that, that they live. Um, but we suffered from lack of hot water, lack of heat and, and all of that when we lived in, in, in the tenements. And, um, but, by the same token, we, we, there was a feeling of, a strong feeling of community there. A strong feeling of community and uh, the men would gather and play dominoes on the corner in the corner bodega and they would discuss the themes of the day and surrounded by people from the neighborhood there, there was a feeling that there was at least one place where we belonged, even if when we went to school or, or you went to the workplace, you didn't belong. And I remember my mother working in a factory and while she could read and write in English because she studied in English in the schools in Puerto Rico, as did my father, um, speaking it was a challenge with the accent and she would come home in tears because of the abuse of the uh, factory foreman and, and so on. Um, and my father worked as many jobs as he could, sometimes three jobs at a time just to make ends meet. So economically, it was a tremendous challenge. Um, the gift was civil service and the civil service exams and the ability to uh, take the exams for the post office. My father uh, got a job with the General Services Administration. Uh, he was a green shirt at the time. GSA was not specialized the way it is today. 
um, every department was a specialized. And, uh, and so you had to be a jack of all trades, basically. Um, and he wound up driving big rigs and um, doing everything, doing janitorial work, doing electrical work, uh, doing whatever he had to do uh, within GSA. All, all, yeah, I was gonna ask, all, all for the federal government. All, all for the federal government, including making deliveries to the Emanuel Cellar building, the Brooklyn Eastern District Courthouse, where um, I had the honor of having you swear me in at my formal, uh, at my formal induction. Um, so it, it was the access to civil service. And again, he learned about that through the family members who came here first, right? So they learned about it and they were the ones who helped us get jobs and, and helped us maneuver through, through the school system. They got here by plane. I think it was something like an eight hour trip um, on a plane that my father said was held together by rubber pants. <laughs> he, he said it sounded like the thing was gonna fall apart any second. And they wore their Sunday best and brought their own food onto the plane. Um, Benil and everything else that they could that they could manage to get to get on board. <laughs> My father's family came here a little bit before both of yours. Um, uh, my grandfather and grandmother uh, came to. Uh, New York when they were in their preteens in uh, they were both born there he was born in 1914 she was born in 1915 so they came here fairly young um, and in fact my grandfather uh, um, he had uh, nine sisters two of whom were older than him the rest are younger than him and um, all the ones younger than him were born in New York. Um, and so they, they first came to Manhattan. They, they hailed from Santurce, both, my, both of my grandparents. And uh, they came to New York young, uh, um, lived in Manhattan, met in Manhattan, uh, started their family in Manhattan. And then in 1944, 44, 45, they moved from Manhattan to Brooklyn into the then brand new um, Fort Greene projects. And a similar similar story to your uh, your cousins in, in the, the tenement, to a three bedroom, which for the for at that time was was pretty big, uh, bedroom for my grandparents bedroom for my aunt, my father's the, the oldest of the family. She got her own room. And then all the boys, um, five boys went into one bedroom with, uh, with could fit only two bunk beds in it. And so one of the brothers had to, the youngest one had to alternate uh, uh, beds each night. But so, so we've been here for a while. I'm now, I guess, uh, uh, second generation um, Puerto Rican. And um, of my father's era, uh, generation, um, none of them went to college until my aunt, she graduated from uh, University of San Antonio at 70 and got a master's degree at 72. My father, um, who was skipped from ninth grade to 11th grade and dropped out and then got a GED through the Marines, um, ended up getting his bachelor's degree at 61 from the University of Texas at San Antonio. But of that generation, they were the only two who went to college. And of course, later after, you know, after I had, and, and my generation had gone. Um, but they all, almost all of them um, were able to move out and move up through civil service. My, my father uh, was a correction officer, two uncles who uh, uh, became detectives in the police department, another uncle who was a sanitation worker. My, my grandfather, in fact, later 
and life became a sanitation worker. He drove um, one of the greatest things I ever saw as a kid was him driving one of the street sweepers. Uh, back then they had, uh, I still I think maybe they still have three wheels, but I thought it was the, it was the, the best thing. Um, so yeah, it's, we were here early on, uh, relatively early on, um, but they never lost uh, their, their home, their birthplace. So far I've, in hearing each of you, I can't help but note the connections, the importance of public jobs, that is jobs for, in, for the government, public housing, and public education. I mean, those are incredibly three important themes in the lives of each of you. I should say, Judge, that um, what we experienced was um, we stayed there through the deterioration of the projects. So we were the first families, and in the beginning, it was really um, a wonderful experience. They were highly integrated. There were white families and black families. Um, there were seniors. Every floor was very integrated. But the key was that it was low to low middle income housing. You had to have a job. They did not allow people with criminal um, histories to live in the projects. And, uh, and the neighborhood itself was in a bit of transition, but there were still a lot of Jews and Irish in the, in, in the neighborhood, African Americans and, and mostly Puerto Ricans, as you, as you noted. So the schools in the neighborhood also were still pretty integrated. So I had Italian kids and Irish kids, Irish Puerto Rican kids. Uh, there was a lot of intermarriage between Irish and Puerto Ricans and Italians and Puerto Ricans, probably because of the Catholic faith. Um, black kids um, and, 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 and as I said, Puerto Ricans. So those were the, and some Jewish kids as well. Some of the housing that my father's, one of my father's younger brothers moved to in, in the Marcy houses. Um, it was not so great at the time that he moved in. They were not first families moving, moving in there. But I can tell you that by the time I was in junior high school, we moved there when I was in elementary school. When I was in junior high school, um, things were changing not for the better. And after a while, it was a daily fear leaving the house as to whether you would make it back alive or uh, without being robbed or without being raped, uh, whether the elevators would be working. We lived on a 16th floor. That was not a happy experience. When I was in high school, the gangs moved into the area. And by now, most of the whites had left. They had gone to wherever they went to, suburbia, wherever they went to. And I have vivid images of looking out our window. We looked onto the avenue and seeing uh, whole hordes of savage skulls turning over public buses. And, um, and it was a pretty scary experience. But we persevered. Um, through it. I mean, we did sort of isolate. You were prisoners in your own home. But at least for me, it inspired me to want to do something to change the plight of my community that they should not have to live like that. And, and what can I do to make the lives of people in my community better? And, um, and so that, that was part of an inspiration to going into um, the law.